بسم الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه ما بعد. So we continue inshallah ta'ala from chapter number four and the author says باب الخوف على من لم يفهم القرآن أو يكون من المنافقين chapter number four suspicion of hypocrisy regarding the heedless and as we mentioned before the salat the author mentioned the chapter of the importance of understanding the Quran and now he's going to mention the chapter of those people who don't understand the Quran is feared for them that either they will be considered to be hypocrites or to be from the heedless or to be from the negligent and all of these people Allah mentions them in the Quran and warns us concerning them do not be from amongst them so here for example Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions or the author Muhammad ta'ala rather mentions two verses the first of them is the verse in surah Muhammad وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَسْتَمِعُوا إِلَيْكَ حَتَّى إِذَا خَرَجُوا مِنْ عِنْدِكَ among them are those or some who listen to you to when they go forth from your presence. They ask those who are present with you, what do these people just say? Meaning that these, this was the way of the hypocrites. They would sit with the Prophet wasallam. Then as soon as they left, they would say to others, we didn't understand the word of what he was just saying. And they said this out of arrogance, out of disbelief. Not because they genuinely didn't understand what he was saying, because he spoke Arabic and he spoke cl- clearly and plainly, but because they didn't want to accept Islam. And that's why Allah Azza says, These are the people that Allah Azza has sealed their hearts. The second verse he mentions is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, Already have we urged into how fire many of the jinn and mankind having hearts with which they did not understand. So Allah Azza wa mentions, as we said before, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala often describes the hypocrites in the Quran, He describes them as being deaf and dumb and blind, not being able to understand. So a person who does understand the Quran or makes no attempt to understand the Quran, it's feared for them that they have a trait from the traits of hypocrisy. And there's a difference between being a hypocrite because hypocrisy is a form of disbelief and between having a trait of hypocrisy because those people are still Muslims but they just have a trait from the traits of hypocrisy like the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith from the signs of hypocrisy is when you speak you lie and when you make a promise you break the promise and when you're entrusted with something you don't fulfill that trust these are called signs of hypocrisy those people are still Muslims we don't say they're not they're not Muslims but what they're doing is more like hypocrisy than it is to the way that a Muslim should behave. So this is similar to it. People who don't understand or seek to understand the Quran, that's what the hypocrites used to do. They used to live in Medina, they would hear the Quran, they would spend time with the Prophet wasallam, but they never sought to study the Quran. They never sought to actually try to understand the Quran. They just sat there because it was expected of them. And they went there because it was expected of them. So this is what the author is referring to. And then he mentions the hadith of Asma radiallahu anha that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and we will read the English uh, just so that it's, it's quicker. You will be put to trials in your graves and these trials will be like the trials of the Dajjal. You will be asked, what do you know about this man? Then the faithful believer will reply, he's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger of Allah who came to us with clear evidences and guidance and so we accepted his teachings and followed him. Then the angel will say to him, sleep in peace as we have come to know that you are a faithful believer. On the other hand, the, the hypocrite or the doubter will reply, I do not know, but I heard the people saying something, so I said it, Al-Bukhari and Muslim. In this hadith, the Prophet wasallam in the grave when Allah Azza wa Jalla will send the angels to question people in their graves. You have the believers who because of their iman, they will respond, Allah is my Lord, my religion is Islam. This man that was sent was the Prophet wasallam. When it comes to the hypocrites and the non-believers, what will they say? They will say, we don't know, we don't know. We heard the people saying something, so we said something similar. What the author is showing here is that these people still said it. Didn't the hypocrites say, la ilaha illallah? Yeah, that's what made them apparently on the outside appear to be Muslims. Didn't they come and pray in the masjid? pray behind the Prophet wasallam, sit with the companions. We even know in certain narrations in the hadith, in the seerah, they even performed jihad, some of them. Some of them went on the expeditions for jihad. 
So they did a number of things, but it wasn't from sincerity. It wasn't in the heart. It was just actions and words. So what the author is saying here is that this is the way that the hypocrites believe. They do things, but they don't actually believe it. So someone who reads Quran, but they make no attempt to understand, no attempt to follow, no attempt to accept its rulings, that person you fear for them, that this is like what the hypocrites did. It's a sign of hypocrisy. So therefore the believer isn't a person, the Muslim shouldn't be the one who only reads the words but doesn't seek to understand. Only looks at the words but doesn't seek to study and to learn and to educate themselves. And so this is what the author Rahimullah Ta'ala is referring to. And then he mentions the next hadith which is the hadith of Al-Bara radiyallahu an, also in Sahih al-Bukhari. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the believer will reply that he is Allah's messenger and the two angels will say you read Allah's book, believed in it and affirmed it accordingly. And this is the wording of Abu Dawood. This is the narration of Abu Dawood. The hadith itself is in Bukhari and Muslim but this wording is found in Abu Dawood. Why when they say the believer says he is Allah's messenger what do the angels reply? How did you know this? You knew this because you read Allah's book and you believed in Allah's book. So it's more than just reading, it is belief and following. Now that doesn't mean, just to make it clear, that the vast majority of Muslims, because they don't seek to learn or study the Quran, the hypocrites or the non-Muslims, no. But it's just something which he says, Babul Khawf, we fear for them. That it's not a good thing to do to be upon that kind of way of thinking and living where your connection with the Qur'an is just a very surface type of connection. It's a very shallow connection. You read the Qur'an when, you're, when, when it's something which you know, suits you or is convenient to you, or it's the month of Ramadan, or your connection with the Qur'an is very, very shallow, very small, very light. The believer should be someone who is fully engaged with the Qur'an, always reading, always studying, always learning. This is what the way, the, the way of the believer, and this is how they should be when it comes to when it comes to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Both author Rahimullah ta'ala then mentions the next chapter and he says, Bab, Qawlillahi ta'ala wa minhum ummiyuna la ya'lamun al-kitaba illa amani. Chapter 5, and Allah's statement, and there are amongst them unlettered ones who know not the book. This is now the chapter that will speak, not about those who don't even seek to understand. These are the people now who read, but they don't understand. They have the words and they don't understand. Because in the Quran, Allah Azza wa when He speaks about the Jews and the Christians and the past nations that also had scriptures, they had the Torah, they have the Injil, they still read the Torah and they read the Injil. Even till today, they read their Gospel, they read their Bible, they read their Torah. It is something which they still read. But Allah Azza wa says that their reading is not enough if they don't believe. Their reading isn't enough if they don't accept Tawheed and they don't accept the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. وَمِنْهُمْ أُمِّيُّونَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الْكِتَابَ إِلَّا أَمَانِي There are from amongst them unlettered ones who all they know from, book, from the book, from the scripture, is wishful thinking. Is wishful thinking. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he said in his tafsir of this verse, that Allah Azza wa Jal is warning us against being like the Jews and the Christians who would read, and all they would do is read. It was just recitation and reading for them with very little understanding. They wouldn't stop to think, to reflect, to study, to learn. So Allah Azza wa Jal sent to us the Qur'an, then He explained the Qur'an for us. In the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Qur'an has been explained so that you may understand the rulings of the Qur'an, the lessons of the Qur'an, the principles of the Qur'an. You have to go back to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught to the companions and their statements, and then those who came after the companions from the Tabi'een and the other scholars. And that's why he then mentions the second verse in Surah Al-Jumu'ah. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ حُمِّلُوا التَّوْرَاتَ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَحْمِلُوهَا كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُوا أَسْفَارًا The example of those who carried the Torah and those who did not carry it is like the example of the donkey carrying scrolls. Someone who reads but doesn't benefit is like the one that's like the donkey that's carrying books but can't benefit from it. The donkey on its back has a load of books. Does that make the donkey knowledgeable? Does it make the donkey educated? Does it make the donkey a person, a, a thing of knowledge, an animal of knowledge? No, because it's just carrying. The carrying by itself doesn't mean anything. So likewise, the Muslim is told, don't just read, but you're meant to understand. This was the way of the companions. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh said that we, the companions, wouldn't take more than 10 verses at a time. 
we would read them, memorize them, study them, learn them, act upon them, then we would move on to the next 10. And that's why it's said that the likes of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhum, it took him 10 years to finish Surah Al-Baqarah. 10 years to memorize and learn Surah Al-Baqarah because they would do it with understanding. Our problem today is we want to finish. We want to finish, it's a race. We need to finish, finish, finish. And because we're so worried about finishing, often what happens is we don't even get very far. Because we put in our mind a timeline. I have three months I want to finish the Quran. So if you don't do it in three months, then what? Then we give up. I have two years to memorize the Quran. And if after six months you didn't hit your targets, you missed all of your targets, you just give up. The companions didn't care about finishing. Companions won't care, didn't care about the finishing because they knew that every single word they read is ibadah. It's worship, it's a reward. So why then does it matter when you will finish? It's meant to be a lifelong pursuit, a lifelong journey with the Quran. Not just something you do for a year or intensively for six months or two years or five years or ten years. And that's why the people of the Quran, even when they finish memorizing the Quran, what do they do? They revise, they revise, they revise. Sometimes people come to me and they say, they say to me, oh, that our child is learning Quran, but they have mistakes. You know, the memory is a little, a little bit weak. They have mistakes in their Quran. I say to them, don't worry. The rest of their life, they will do nothing except revision. Let them finish. They don't have anything else to do. You finish the Quran and it's weak, what will you do? Go and read the Quran a second time. Finish a third time. Finish a fourth time. Finish a fifth time. Finish a... How many times you finish, inshallah, it will become stronger and stronger and stronger. You have nothing else. Our connection with the Quran isn't that we finish today and that's it, alhamdulillah, no more Quran. No. You finish the Quran, what should you do the next day? Start again from Baqarah. Now that's what you have to do the rest of your life. All you're doing is muraja, revision. So this is the way that the companions were. Their thing was a lifelong connection with the Quran. And so when you have a temporary limit on your Quran, the way that we normally do, we put a temporary limit or a timeline on the Quran, that then restricts your ability to learn. And very quickly you're demotivated. Very quickly you give up. Because often we miss our targets. We're very ambitious. We miss our targets. So what we will do most likely is we will just give up. As opposed to, okay, I missed two days, let me now carry on. Let me recalibrate. Let me reschedule. We think, oh no, it's too late now. It's finished. People come to me and say this, you know, I wanted my child to memorize Quran by age 11. Because in the UK, 11, we go to secondary school. So 11 wanted them to finish. They didn't finish. How much did you do? 20 juz. That's amazing, you did 20 juz. If you did 20 juz now, you give him another year or maybe two, he will finish. Correct? But no, time's up. <laughs> Why is the time up? Why? Who, who said time up? You just made it up yourself that he has no more time. You said that. No law, no government, no, no one said it's time up. You said it's time up. So now you shift his focus. He did 20 juz of the Quran. And that doesn't mean that he can't do it. He just took slightly longer than you expected. How many people memorize 20 juz of the Quran? It's amazing. So this mindset is a problem. And so when it comes to the Quran, it should be a lifelong pursuit. And then he mentions the hadith of Abu Darda, radiyallahu an, in which he says, we were with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and looked towards the sky. And he said, there will be a time when knowledge departs and they will be left incapable. Ziyad ibn Labid al-Ansari radiyallahu an asked, how can knowledge part or messenger of Allah whilst we recite the Quran? By Allah, we will read it and teach it to our children and our wives. He replied, may your mother be bereaved of you, O Ziyad. I thought you were amongst the most learned men of Medina. Do not these Jews and Christians read the Torah and the gospel, but it doesn't benefit them? Collected by a Tirmidhi who said that it is a Hassan Gharib hadith. This hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying that a time will come, knowledge will leave. The people will understand the Quran. So Ziyad ibn Labid al-Ansari, this companion Ziyad, he was from the early Muslims. He is the only Muslim, it is said, that migrated to both Mecca and Medina. So he came from outside of Mecca and he left his homeland and he came to live in, 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 in Mecca with the Prophet before the Hijrah. And then after the Hijrah, he made Hijrah to Medina. 
So they used to often say Ziyad ibn Labid is a Muhajiri and an Ansari. He's both. He's from the Ansar, from the people of Medina. So he's Ansari. He came to Mecca to live there before the Hijrah. He said, no, the Prophet I believe in Islam. I'm going to live in Mecca with him, which was not the norm. What happened? Most people left Mecca. They lived in, settled in Medina. He did both. He was from Medina. He said, I will live in Mecca. Then when Allah said, no, go and make Hijrah back to Medina, he left and came back to Medina. So he used to often say he's Muhajiri and Ansari. So he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, how can we not have knowledge when we read the Quran, we're going to teach it to our children, the children will teach it to their children, their children, their children. we will do this. So the Prophet ﷺ said, O oh, Ziyad, don't you see the other people read their books as well? But they don't have guidance from it. Why? Because they lost the knowledge. They have the words, but the knowledge has been lost. The meaning has been lost. They changed the meaning or they ignored the meaning or they forgot the meaning. And that's what happens when you don't study the Quran. And as we said, over time, this will happen because the Prophet ﷺ told us from the signs of Yom al Qiyamah is that knowledge will be lifted. How will it be lifted? With the death of the people of knowledge. So that's what happens because less and less people learn and the people that do learn, slowly but surely they pass away. So there's less people to teach and over time then, that knowledge starts to also leave. And so it's important, every one of us has a duty. If for no one else, just for your own family, just for you and your family, to make sure that you learn what you can so that you can teach your children, that they can teach their children, that you start a good practice of the Quran. I know people, in, in, and as I was saying to one of the brothers, when I was young, in my whole family, there may be only one or two of us that memorize the Quran. When I was a child, in my whole family, only one or two of us that memorize the Quran, no one else. Now in my children, like my children's generation, my nephews, nieces, all of these young children in our family, Alhamdulillah, we have like maybe 10, 11, 12 already that have memorized the Quran, and more are still learning. Inshallah, there will be more. See what one generation difference can make? Someone just has to start. In my parents' generation, no one. I don't know anyone that memorized the Quran. Maybe one person, maybe Allah alam. But very, very few. So they started very slowly. You have one or two in the next generation. Those two people now, they understand the Quran. They motivate other people around them. Look, Quran, Quran, Quran. So now with their children, a number of them start. Now you have 9, 10, 11, 12 in the family. Inshallah, when they grow up, they will not only for their children, but their other people around them as well, motivate them to do Quran. And so you have, inshallah, many people that memorize the Quran now. Before, there was only one person in the family that can lead salah. Salah time, only one half it, he has to lead. Now, mashallah, there's so many you can choose, whoever you want. And that is the barakah of the Quran. But it needs to be something which we do together. And then he mentions the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, that when the following verse was revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna fi khalqi samawati wal ardi wa ikhtilafi layli wal nahar, indeed in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the alternation of the day and the night are signs for a people of understanding all the way until subhanaka faqina adhab and nar glory be to you save us from the fire he said woe to the one who reads this and does not reflect upon it this is a long hadith in ibn habba ibn hibban the hadith of aisha radiallahu anha aisha she said the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam one night he came to me and he said oh aisha don't disturb me tonight let me worship let me pray she said he began to pray and he started to cry until his beard became wet with his tears. And he stood for a long time crying. And then he went into ruku and he cried. Came out of ruku and cried. Went into sajda and cried. He cried so much that the ground became wet with his tears. And then he finished the salah. This is Qiyamul Layl, the Hajjud. And then after he finished, he was sitting. And Bilal radiallahu an came and he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, it's time for Fajr. Time for salah. But he saw him crying. So he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, do you cry like this when Allah has forgiven you for all of your sins, past and future? So the Prophet said, Afala akun wa abdan shakura. Should I not be a grateful slave? And then he mentioned this hadith. Tonight there were verses revealed to me. Woe to the one who reads it and doesn't reflect upon it, doesn't contemplate them. إِنَّ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ لَآيَاتٍ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ 
ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار Those who don't reflect on these verses Allah created the heavens and the earth alternated the day and the night also that people may understand the signs of Allah Azza wa Jal those who remember Allah as they stand as they sit as they lie down and what is the greatest remembrance of Allah? The Quran. Those who remember Allah as they stand and they sit and they lie down and they think, they think about the creation of the heavens and the earth and they say, Oh Allah, you didn't create this out of just and plain. Glory be to you, save us from the fire. They look at the signs around them and it reminds them of Allah. They read the Quran, it reminds them of Allah. And how much of the Quran? speaks about the signs of Allah, the universe, the human body, all of these different things that we have, the oceans, the mountains, everything is mentioned so that you may connect it back to your Lord and your Creator subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the point that the author is making is what? You have to learn. You have to study. When you understand, you can reflect. When you understand, you can contemplate. When you, can, when you understand, you can ponder. But if you don't understand, how can you reflect? You don't even know what it means let alone reflect on what it means. So you have to study and learn. And that's why tafsir is so important. Even if you take a basic, simple tafsir, a short tafsir, but at least now you understand what Allah Azza wa is saying. And that is important then for you to be able to stop and to reflect and to think about what Allah Azza wa is giving to us in the Quran. The author, rahimahullah ta'ala, he then mentions the next chapter, Babu ithmi man fajara bil Quran. The sin of using the Qur'an in disobedience. This chapter now is speaking about those people who not only don't contemplate the Qur'an, they don't reflect on the Qur'an, they don't study the Qur'an, they don't understand the Qur'an, they do worse. They use the Qur'an to justify the haram that they do. They misunderstand the Qur'an, they misinterpret the Qur'an, and then they will use the Qur'an to justify what they do. And that is sinful. As we know, it is a major sin in Islam. As we know, there are many different groups amongst the Muslims. From the time of the companions, many different people came with many different ideas. Each one of them always used the Quran, whoever they were. Whether it was the people that killed the companions, whether it was the people that denied some of Allah's names and attributes, whether it's the people who used to go and, and oppress others, whatever they are, whoever they are or deny the qadr of Allah, Allah's pre-decree, wherever they were, all of them have one thing in common, which is what? They used the Qur'an to justify what they were upon. And this is what the author is referring to now. And that's why he mentions the verse, وَمَا يُضِلُّ بِهِ إِلَّا الْفَاسِقِينَ And he misleads thereby only the corrupt. Meaning that these are the people who use the Qur'an, not only for their own disobedience, but to justify their disobedience to justify the haram that they have done. And why? Why do they misuse the Qur'an? Because they didn't understand the Qur'an correctly. They didn't study and learn, so they misunderstood. Someone takes a verse, they take it out of context. Someone reads a verse, they don't understand the sunnah along with the verse. So now they have an idea to them, it makes sense, it's good. But the religion isn't based upon my sense or your sense, my logic or your logic, my understanding or your understanding. No. Allah Azza wa revealed the Qur'an and told the Prophet ﷺ to explain it. That's how the religion is understood. So those companions, that's how they understood their religion. What did Allah say? What did the Prophet say wasallam? Because the people and their understanding differs. My logic, different to your logic. My understanding, different to your understanding. So when you open up the door to what makes sense, different things make different sense to different people. So then everyone has their own version of Islam. No, that's not how the religion works. Ali radiallahu anhu said, if it was going to be by logic, then when wudu, when you wipe over the socks, it would make more sense to wipe under the bottom of the sock than the top. That's the one that touches the ground, the bottom of the sock, not the top of the sock. That would make more sense. But he said, I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam wipe the top of the sock. So that's what we do. Umar came to the Kaaba, kissed the black stone. He said, I know you're just a stone. You can't do anything, it's just a rock, just a stone. But if it weren't that I saw the Prophet ﷺ kiss you, I would never have kissed you. That's our religion. Not about necessarily what makes sense to you or me or anyone else. And that doesn't mean the religion doesn't make sense. It makes sense. But sense only once you've studied and you've learned the principles of Islam and you appreciate the principles of the Quran and the Sunnah, then it makes sense. But you don't understand something because you didn't study something, then obviously that's different. 
Like someone wants to try to understand neurosurgery, they don't even understand the basics of medicine. Not going to be possible. Someone doesn't know any maths, they want to understand advanced physics. Not going to be possible. So likewise with the Sharia, requires for you to understand the basics before you go on. And then he mentions other verse, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ مِمَا أَنزَرَ اللَّهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ Whosoever judges not by that which Allah Azza wa revealed, such are disbelievers. And the verse, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْتُمُونَ مَا أَنزَرَ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَيَشْتَغُونَ بِهِ ثَمَنًا قَلِيلًا Indeed, those who conceal what Allah has revealed of the book and trade with it for a paltry sum. And all of these verses are people who use the Qur'an to justify the haram that they are doing. To justify the haram that they are doing. He then mentions the hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu an that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there will appear in this nation, and he did not say from it, some people whose prayer will make you look down upon your prayers. They will recite the Quran, but it will not exceed their throats. They will go out of Islam as an arrow goes, goes through the game, whereupon the archer will examine the arrowhead and look at the feathered part. Is there any sign of blood collected by Al-Bukhari and Muslim? This hadith of the Prophet ﷺ speaks about a group that would emerge after his time. So this is a prophecy. After my time, this group will emerge. And they were known as the people of the Khawarij. And they came towards the end of the time of Uthman. And then they flourished in the time of Ali. And he fought them. The Prophet ﷺ is speaking to the companions, to Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali. And he's saying to them that if you were to compare your salah to their salah, you will think that your salah isn't worthy. If you were to compare your fasting to their fasting, you would think that your fasting isn't good enough. Meaning when it comes to worship, these are people who pray more than you. They fast more than you. They read the Quran more than you, as is in one narration. However, when they read the Quran, how do they describe it? doesn't pass beyond their throats. Meaning that it's all just words. What's beyond the throat? The heart. It doesn't, doesn't penetrate the heart. And that's why he said they will leave the religion quicker, faster than an arrow leaves the bow. Why? Those people of the Khawarij, when they killed the companions, they killed a number of them and fought them. These are the people that Allah said about in the Quran, radiyallahu anhum maradu an. Allah is pleased with them, they are pleased with Allah. Allah promised them paradise in the Quran. Allah chose them to be the companions of his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They said these people are not Muslims. They said they're not Muslims, they're not disbelievers. And they killed them and they fought them. And they killed a number of them. Why? Because they misunderstood the Quran. They misunderstood. So they started to criticize Uthman, criticize Ali, criticize a number of these major companions. These companions are the same ones that the Prophet ﷺ said, you're guaranteed Jannah. Some of them are from the ten that Allah promised paradise to. And they fought them and they killed some of them. This is what happens when you don't understand the Quran. And so that's why the author is mentioning these ahadith. Very important that you don't use the Quran to justify your desires, what makes sense to you, what you like, what you prefer. No. The Quran is about sacrificing and submitting to Allah's will. You sacrifice your desires because Allah said do this. You submit to what Allah said because that is what Allah Azza wa wants from you and wants from your iman. And in the other narration, as the author then mentions, they will only recite the Qur'an, meaning that they won't understand it. And Ibn Umar used to declare them the worst of creation and said, they would apply the revealed verses concerning infidels upon the believers. Meaning the verses that speak about kufr and disbelief, they would apply them to the believers. At tirmidhi collected the narration of Abu Huraira and declared it sad that Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, whoever is questioned about knowledge and conceals it, shall be bridled with the bridle of fire on the day of resurrection. These are the people that used to say that if someone commits a major sin, they're not a Muslim. Someone commits a major sin, they're not a Muslim. Even though the Prophet ﷺ said that anyone that dies upon La ilaha illallah will ultimately enter into Jannah. Eventually, they will all enter into Jannah. They said no. So then they came and they said about the companions, they've committed major sins. And they didn't commit major sins, but they, in their thinking, their logic, these were major sins. And so they cast them outside of the fold of Islam and they fought them. And so this is why the Prophet ﷺ warned against these people. Beware of them. And it's important to know they came at which generation? The time of? The companions. So even in that time, people misunderstood the Qur'an. So what about 1400 years later? 
So it's important then to study the Quran, to learn the Quran, to make sure when you're studying and learning the Quran, that the way that you do it and the source that you take it from is someone who has knowledge, a teacher that knows what they're doing, who understands, who goes back to the books, who refers to the narrations, who understands and gives tafsir according to the understanding of the companions, radiallahu anhum ajma'in. We will take one final chapter, inshallah, then we will finish for today. And that is chapter number seven, Babu Ithmi Man Raya Al Quran. The sin of showing off with the Quran. And he mentions the hadith here of Abu Huraira radiallahu an, which I think many of you are probably familiar with. And that is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Indeed, the first people to be judged on the day of resurrection will be a martyr. He will be brought forth and reminded of his blessings, which he will acknowledge. It will be said to him, What did you do with these blessings? He will reply, I fought, I fought for your sake, O oh Allah, until I was martyred. It will be said, You lie, rather, you fought so that the people will be called, that you would be called courageous. And so it was said, the command will be given, he will be dragged on his face and thrown into the fire. Then a man who sought and taught knowledge and read the Quran will be brought forth and reminded of his blessings. Which he will acknowledge, it will be said to him, what did you do with these blessings? And he will reply, I sought and taught knowledge and read the Quran for your sake. It will be said, you lie, rather you sought, to, uh, sought knowledge and to be called a scholar. And read the Quran to be called a reciter. And so it was said, the command will be given and he will be thrown dragged on his face and thrown into the fire. Then a man for whom Allah made life easy and to whom was given every type of wealth will be brought forth and reminded of the blessings which he will acknowledge will be said to him, what did you do with these blessings? He will reply, do not leave a path that you love except that I spent in that cause. It will be said, you lie, rather you spent to be called generous and so it was said. The command will be given and will be dragged on his face and thrown into the fire, collected by Imam Muslim. This hadith is a warning. That when it comes to the Quran and the study of the Quran and reading the Quran, anything to do with the book of Allah Azza wa Jal, it should first and foremost be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It should have sincerity and ikhlas to please Allah Azza wa Jal. And that is when the Quran has barakah. When it's done for Allah, for the sake of Allah, to please Allah, Allah blesses your relationship with the Quran and the benefits and the blessings you find from the Quran. But when it's done for the dunya, because that's one of the signs of Yawm Al-Qiyamah, that the people will use the Quran to get from the dunya. And we'll mention this, inshallah, in more detail tomorrow because one of the chapters is taking a income for teaching the Quran, which is an important issue. But people generally who use the Quran just so that they become famous, so that people praise them, so that they can get something from the dunya, not for Allah's sake, that is from the major sins. And they will be from the first people that Allah will judge on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. All three of these people, the martyr, the person who read the Quran, the one who is generous, what do they have in common? Showing off. They did it not for Allah's sake. So Allah Azza wa Jal will throw them into the fire for that sin that they committed. And that is the sin of showing off because it is minor shirk to do it for other than Allah's sake. You do it so that people praise you, the people like you, you become famous, you get money, whatever it may be. That's your primary reason. That's your main concern. That is something which is a major sin in Islam. And so the author wanted to mention this because it's important as you learn Quran, you study Quran, you read Quran, that you do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you do it for the sake of Allah azza wa jal, then Allah will bless you. Every day you want to learn Quran, not because you want to finish or you want to become famous or you want to teach or anything else. You do it for Allah's sake. Mujahid, rahimahullah ta'ala, the famous student of Ibn Abbas, he said that I read the whole Quran to Ibn Abbas three times. At the end of every verse, I stopped him and I said, what does this verse mean? What is the tafsir of this verse? And he would tell me. Three times he did this with the same teacher. The whole Quran. Can you imagine? Every Quran. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Okay, stop. What does that mean? What's the tafsir? What did the Prophet ﷺ say about it? Okay. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Stop. What does that mean? What's the tafsir? What did the Prophet ﷺ say about it? Okay. Maliki Yomid. Stop every single verse of the Quran. Can you imagine how much effort, time that takes? But Mujahid is the Imam of Tafsir. Imam al-Shafi'i used to say, if the Tafsir of Mujahid comes to you, it's enough. Don't need anything else. Enough for you to know his Tafsir. Became the Imam of Tafsir. Rahimahullah ta'ala. Look at how Allah blessed him. Every book of Tafsir goes back to Mujahid. Mentions his statements, mentions his narrations. Mujahid is the Imam of Tafsir. 
but he looked at the time and effort he put into it. Why? Because he wasn't concerned about, oh, I want to become famous, or I want to quickly finish, or I want... No, he wants to learn. Someone that wants to learn finishes the book once, and then goes back again, and goes back again, and goes back again. That's what we do with the Quran. You finished it once, go back again. Finish it twice, go back again. If you want to learn the Sunnah, do the same with Bukhari and Muslim, these books of Hadith. Don't just read it once, read it a second time, a third time, because we know this, right? Just from human experience. If you read something multiple times, you'll understand it better. The first time you read it, but you miss things. The second time, all oh, those things that make sense. The third time, oh, I understand this better now. By the fifth, sixth, seventh time, you kind of know the book by heart anyway. It's very familiar to you. Now imagine you did this with the Quran. You do the tafsir of the Quran so many times over, over, over again. It becomes easy for you to know because you spent your life dedicated to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't be, because one of the traps of shaitan is he looks at a good deed and he looks at how to twist it, change it into a bad deed. This is one of the traps of shaitan. He knows this person is good. Their heart is pure. They want to worship Allah. So he looks at that good deed, the act of worship. How can I make that something which is disliked to Allah? Make it an act of disobedience. And one of the easiest ways is through the heart. By corrupting your intention. Corrupting your sincerity. So now that a person starts to look at other people. Or people just generally know this person is a person who reads the Quran, mashallah, learns Quran. So they start to praise him. They start to speak good of him. They look up to him. But that person now for them, it's a trial. It's a test. Because they don't know how now people look up to me. I have to pretend. I have to pr have to seem, and so they start to lose their sincerity. So it is important to have ikhlas. When you have ikhlas, even in a small action, the action becomes tremendous. But when you have no ikhlas, even if you finish the whole Quran, it won't mean anything. And so this is what the author Muhammad Taala wanted us to know. And with that, inshallah Taala, we will come to the end of. Today's session. Barakallahu feekum. If there's any questions, we take questions maybe for three, four, five minutes, and then inshallah we will stop. Barakallahu. Oh, okay. We already stopped. They turned the lights off. In England, this means go home. I don't know what it means in Kuwait. Is there any etiquettes for reading the Quran like online or on a tablet or something? So obviously the general etiquettes of reading the Quran, it's always better to be in a state of wudu. Before you read the Quran, you should say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem. If it's the beginning of a surah, you recite the Basmalah, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, other than for Surah Al-Tawbah. And you should have respect for the Quran in terms of the way you read the Quran and sit with the Quran and concentrate with the Quran. But there's no harm in someone leaning back or lying down if they need to, if they're tired. As Allah Azza wa Jalla, as we mentioned in those verses, the hadith, الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُرُمْ They remember Allah standing, sitting, lying on their side. And Aisha said, the Prophet used to remember Allah في جميع أحواله. Remember Allah in all of his situations, wherever he was, whatever he was doing. So it's permissible, but obviously it's better to be sitting up, to be concentrating, because otherwise you're not going to be able to necessarily focus on the Quran in that way. And Allah knows best. He has a couple, of, uh, just let him finish his two or three questions. There's two things to do for non-Arabic speakers when it comes to understanding the Quran. The first of them is learn Arabic, which is the obvious one. Learn Arabic. And in this country, you have the opportunity to learn Arabic. You have many different classes and programs and institutions that will teach you Arabic. So to learn as much as you can of this language is the language of the Qur'an. Allah chose it. So the language is blessed. Allah blessed this language. Allah chose it to be the language of the Qur'an, chose it to be the language of the Prophet ﷺ. That should be enough motivation for all of us. So learn what you can to the best of your ability. Number two, learn, because we have much now also available in the English language, in terms of tafsir and translations and lectures and books. We have a great deal now that's available in English. So Allah's made it easy for us even as we are learning Arabic, that we have other sources, inshallah, that we can go to as well. How many?
will that gap have an effect, you mean? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, if you start... Yeah. Issue, yeah. So it's good. I think if one, I think if you restart the Quran with him, so if he did six juz, mashallah, that's very good. It shows he has the ability to memorize, yeah. has the ability to do it. Maybe it will just take him slightly longer. So I often say to people, because sometimes one of the common questions I have is, our children have exams. So maybe two, three months they have exams. Like in the UK, we have exams, secondary exams, and college and university. So it's very difficult for them to memorize. I personally think it's a good life lesson because in life you often have many pressures on you. So you can't give up, you can't say today I'm not going to be a husband because I'm busy at work. You can't say today I won't be a son because I'm busy at school. You have many options, you have to deal with this part of life. So I think we should instill this in our children that okay, you're busy, manage your time better. You have time because even when people are busy, they find time to go and meet their friends, find time to go and eat, find time to go to a restaurant. You have time, it's just you need to manage what's better. But if they have to, just say, for example, no, he says, no, no, no other option, I have to take two months off. I say, okay, take two months off, but just do revision. Revision is easy. Nothing new, just do revision. Don't leave anything. And then as soon as the two months are off, continue. So the fact you take, you take a break isn't a problem. But again, he has to start. So the hardest part will be restarting the schedule. So the first few weeks will be difficult. So that's where you have to be patient, you have to motivate, encourage. But inshallah, once he starts again, then it will become inshallah easy for him. So you complete or not complete any obligation is there? No, there's no obligation. The Quran is an obligatory to memorize. No, 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 no. There's no obligation to memorize the Quran. But it's good. We spoke about all the rewards and everything. So yeah, I think it's something which you should motivate. And it's an amazing achievement. You know, if a child can finish the Quran, I think they can do anything in life. If you can finish the Quran, it shows they have discipline. It shows they have motivation. It shows they can do a great deal of effort. It's a major accomplishment. And if a child at that age can memorize the Quran, they can do anything in life. Because it's not easy to memorize the Quran. You know, it's hard. It takes a lot of time and effort and work. So it just shows they have those characteristics. So, inshallah. That's tomorrow morning, inshallah. Tomorrow morning we speak about how to memorize Quran. Inshallah. So two things. The first thing I say is that we know in the Sunnah, Hadith that Allah honors the poor and the orphan. Allah has rahmah upon them. And this is one of the ways that Allah has rahmah upon these people. Because the people think he's orphan, put him into, into the Quran school. And that's mercy for that child because they will memorize the Quran. So it's one of the ways that Allah honors these people, the poor and the needy and the orphans. Allah honors them by taking them to the path of the Quran. But the second point is that it's a problem in the way that we think. Same, but I come from Pakistan originally, my family. We have the same issue in that country also. That if someone, they don't think he can become a doctor or an engineer, or he can't excel in his academic studies, okay, put them with the studies, with the, with the Quran, and with the, uh, with the Mulvis, they say, you know, with the ulama. And if he's very good and very sharp, no, no, put him in medicine, engineering, and so on. The, the, companions as we know all of them were people of the Quran all of them the rich the poor the people who could read and write the people who couldn't read and write all of them were people of the Quran and so this problem is a problem in our community where we think the Quran is something which is substandard it then has a roll-on effect because then the way the community looks at this child when he grows up and he's a hafiz now he becomes the imam of the masjid they still think he is from that category of people so they don't respect them they don't honor them they treat them very badly. Uh, they don't give them any respect. And that's, as you can see, against what the sunnah is. All these hadith that we study today. Sorry? No money. Yeah, no money. They don't look at And this is part of respect. Part of respect and honor is someone who dedicates their life, spent 10 years, 15 years studying Quran, studying Islam. Then you honor them and help them. They're not teaching your children. 
they're teaching your wives and daughters, they're teaching, you know, they're leading your salah, they're doing the khutbah for you so that you can pray Jumu'ah, doing all of this for you. So at the very least, you should honor them, that they're helping you to fulfill your deen, fulfill your obligations. So that's something which is very important. So this is an issue that we have in, in some communities, not everywhere, because alhamdulillah in the Gulf, you know, alhamdulillah they, they have a different outlook in the way they treat the imams and so on. Also in the US and Canada, it's better. But in Europe, we have this problem. In certain parts of the, of the subcontinent in other countries, we have this problem. But this is again something which the community, as a community, we have to change this. If our connection with the Quran was better, then we would respect other people who finish the Quran. But because our own connection is very weak, then we don't really pay any mind to anyone else. You know, everyone looks at certain things based on their own experience. Everyone respects doctors because all of us know what important job they do when we're sick or a family member is sick. You need those people. They play a vital role in society, otherwise you'd be stuck. So the Imam is the same thing. He fulfills your religion for you, many different aspects of your deen because you have an Imam. If you didn't have an Imam, no one can read Quran, no one knows how to pray Salah, no one can lead. I've been to certain communities in Ramadan, their Taraweeh prayer is 10-15 minutes. Why? Because they have no one to lead. Every single day, Wadduha wal Lady Sajjah up to Nas. Next day, Wadduha wal 10 minutes, 15 minutes, they're done. They don't have anyone. So Allah blessed many of us. It's a blessing people don't realize until it's taken away. So Allah blesses people with having those people with them. So to respect them, honor them. Even, as we said, not because of the person. Why? Because of the Quran. You respect and you honor the words of Allah Azza wa Jal. So you respect that person because of your love for the Quran. Not necessarily because you like them or you don't like them or you know them, you don't know them. It's because of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, Jazakumullah khairan. And inshallah ta'ala, ask me afterwards. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.